of the living languages, the most musical is Chinese. And that's what I recall from that first time, those bright, pure vowels and the rising and falling tones. The words are gone from my mind. Only the sounds remain. Fish bones, I remember, and caves by the sea, and him. Like all my husbands, he was a soldier, a warlord. King, they write it in the transcriptions. But he wasn't born to be ruler of his territory. He fought for it, and by the time I came to him, he was middle-aged. In Chinese, even when a woman speaks deferentially, she is loud and clear, not whispering behind a hand and giggling like in Japanese. I doubt I ever knew his name. My lord, I said, and bowed. Wife, he said, smiling to reveal teeth like needles, like fish bones, filed down in his clan's ritual, or perhaps just from age and wear. Wife number one. Wife number two, who had been wife number one, was older than me, and she killed herself soon after. All her children had died young. Wife number three, who was now wife number two, was a young man, so graceful and polished in his manner that most people accepted the performance as the true gender. But as someone who has been de-sexed, I have a critical eye, alert to hidden potency. My warlord husband and I did well with our combined powers. He took my old homeland the first summer of campaign and doubled his holdings. Over the next years, his territory tripled then became vast, a true kingdom. I gave my lord children a son. Once there was nothing more to gain, we grew lazy, although we lived happily enough. He was always restless. Fighting and acquisition were what he had lived for. Now there was a son to inherit. He took no other women. Sometimes I heard him with wife number two. It was a sim simple wooden palace, more of a stockade or a fort, with small rooms and thin walls. The beautiful man-wife would sing while he strummed the lute. I was content then, lying half awake on my couch, the children with their nursemaid, the new one kicking in my womb, and my fish bones buried in the sand at the ocean's edge for safekeeping. If we ever need them again, I would think, I can dig them up. I have to be an adult before I come into my power. I learned this with the fish when we lived near the caves before I married my warlord husband. It's a feeling like monthly cramps, like you're going to vomit or faint, but you don't, and something else happens instead, something good. When my mother betrayed me, giving me a new dress and wearing my old dirty clothes so the fish would lift its head out of the water, I thought I was sick because I had eaten it, the source of my strength, my fish that she had captured and cooked. Revenge was all I could think about, but I didn't know how I could kill her without being caught. That's when he sent for me. He had heard of me. Someone had found a shoe. My memories are all muddled, and I became his wife. The fish's power was inside me, and the bones would preserve it. My sex, my womanhood, which had been cut off or out of me, had returned. Until I could use it, spend some of its force in a belch of anger or a fart of rage, it roiled my guts in a constant nausea. With my help, my husband and his army could conquer whole cities, not just a few cave dwellers, a wicked stepmother and a mean girl pretty stepsister or two. Or was she really my mother? Were they my own flesh and blood? It doesn't matter. His soldiers showed them no mercy when they reached my old home, ran them down on horseback as they tried to flee, raped them, took the daughters as slaves, and killed the woman. He laughed when he told me, said, it is for you. Of course it wasn't, it's just the way of soldiers, but it was good to hear. He was acknowledging my help, the hidden route around the mountain, the stealth approach, my betrayal surpassing hers, which had allowed him to expand his holdings with little effort and no risk. Later, long after I buried the fish bones on the beach, the waves washed them away. Was I afraid of my own power or simply sated of vengeance? the calm stomach of fair trade for the depleted strength. He had no use for me after that, my childbearing years over, an ordinary woman from a poor family, no great dowry. That's when I left for the city. It was the man-wife, older now but elegant as ever, and with the creased face of happiness, who embraced me at the gate 
wishing me an easy journey and good luck. She wasn't sorry to see me go, yet in our marriage there had been affection, even respect between us. She would be left to care for our husband in his old age, while I was free. How will you make a living, she asked. Storytelling? I answered the polite question with another.